If you go uh, all around the world, worship looks really different in all sorts of different places. In fact, if you just go to different churches in our own town, worship looks very different in lots of different places. But we all have something in common. Uh, we, all, we all somehow share in this meal uh, right here that we're going to celebrate today. We celebrate it once a month at our church. Uh, churches celebrate different frequencies. They don't all call it the same thing. Some churches call it the Lord's Supper. Some churches call it Holy Communion. Some churches call it the Eucharist. But somehow this meal right here is central to all of us, all Christians, throughout all places, through all of time. Somehow this meal right here and sharing in this meal together is central to our faith. And so I just want to share with us this morning, because we do communion once a month, and maybe just help us to reflect upon that. For those of you who have been taking Holy Communion before you ever remember, uh, maybe we'll uh, have a chance to pause and have some renewed wonder at this meal that we share together. For those of you for whom maybe you know, following Jesus is new, and you've been doing this and eating the, taking the bread and dipping the cup, but no real idea what it's all about, then hopefully this will help you as well as, as we gather around this table table. Uh, I think it's helpful if we're going to understand Holy Communion, which we tend to call it here at our church, if we're going to understand Holy Communion, if we go back to the very beginning, now that doesn't surprise a lot of y'all because you've been around here, but uh, let's go back to the very beginning in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2. Listen to what happens, beginning in verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right, what's going on here? Uh, God creates humans and he puts them in a garden with all kinds of wonderful trees that have all kinds of great food on them. But there is one very special tree in the garden that they were going to eat from, and it was called the tree of life. And the tree of life was meant to be eaten from. They would eat from the tree of life. And when they ate from the tree of life, somehow uh, they were receiving wisdom and life from God. To eat from the tree of life was to, was to believe that God alone gives us what is true and good and that God alone defines what life is. And so as they would feast on the tree of life, they would know life as it was intended to be. And so God wanted them to eat from that tree. But there was another tree the Bible tells us about. And that tree was the knowledge, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you're not supposed to eat from that tree. And so when they were going to eat from the tree of life, they would have to pass by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And to pass by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and go to the tree of life was to say, I'm not going to trust in myself. I'm not going to define goodness and life apart from God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to receive wisdom. I'm going to receive life from him. And I'm going to live as his. And I'm not going to be in charge. He's going to be the king. He's going to be the boss. And I'm going to live this trusting relationship with God. And in so doing, I'm going to receive life and blessing and eternal life. That that's what it meant to eat from the tree of life. Adam and Eve, however, uh, made the wrong decision. And they decided that they would eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve said to God, God, you know, your, your way is one way, but we're going to do it our way. We're going to decide for ourselves what is good. We're going to decide for ourselves how you find real life. We're going to follow our hearts. We're going to be true to ourselves. And we're going to put ourselves in charge of this creation that happened right here. And when they did that, God banishes them from the garden. And he tells us that the reason that he banishes them from the garden is so that they can no longer eat from the tree of life. Because if they eat from the tree of life, they'll live forever. And so God banishes them from the garden so that they can no longer feast at that tree where they, where they enjoyed God's presence and life and, and received God's wisdom. They're banished from that. But God doesn't give up, all right? Uh, just because Adam and Eve messed up, God doesn't give up. God is still going to renew and restore his good creation that gets messed up by Adam and Eve. So God raises up a people. 
uh, and he raises up the people called the Jewish people, the Israelites. He raises up a people who will be partners with him in bringing life and blessing to all the world. And he raises up these people. He delivers them from slavery in Egypt. He calls them out. He calls them his own and he gives them a choice. And the choice he gives them is this. You can decide for yourself what is good. You can decide for yourself how to get life. And you can try to take life on your own terms. Or you can trust me. Uh, You can obey me. You can trust my wisdom. And you can trust me to supply your needs and to give you life. And, And if they would do this, if they would trust God, they would be the vehicle through which God would bring life and blessing to all of creation. And so God calls these people together and then God gives them uh, a number of meals throughout the year in which they would gather on a regular basis and they would have a meal. And every time they would gather on a regular basis to have one of these meals, they weren't just remembering something that had happened. That was a part of it. They were remembering something that had happened. But every time they gathered for one of these meals, they were also participating in something that was true. Uh, They were living in something. Uh, For example, the Passover meal. They would gather every year for the Passover meal. And in the Passover meal, they were remembering how God had delivered them out of Egyptian slavery and made them into a people. At the Passover meal, they they would eat the meal reclining on their left side. And the reason that they ate the meal reclining on their left side is because that's how royalty ate. That's how free people ate. They ate reclining on their left side. And so when they ate the Passover meal, they ate reclining, remembering that God had set them free, that they were a free people and that they were a royalty. They were the people of God. And in that moment that they're reclining and they're participating in the Passover meal, they're not just remembering that God at one time delivered them out of slavery in Egypt. They are participating in something. They are free people in this moment. They are tasting freedom. They are tasting what it means to be royalty, to be the people of God, to be free in this meal. They're not just remembering, they're experiencing and tasting something that is true of themselves. In the same way at that meal, they would also uh, it, was, it was tradition that you would not pour your own glass of wine at the Passover meal. Uh, there were four different goblets of wine that would take place during the Passover meal. Uh, and some of y'all are now distracted because like that sounds like a you know, great meal. Uh, but, but during each of those, you would, not, you would not pour your own because royalty didn't pour their own goblet of wine. Somebody else poured it for you. And so it's tradition around the Passover meal that somebody else pours the wine for each person because again, you are free. You are the very people of God. And throughout all of Jewish history, in good times and in hard times, when they were oppressed by the Romans, when they had no homes, uh, when they were dispersed throughout the world, uh, a persecuted people, throughout all these thousands of years, the people would gather. And when they had the Passover meal, they didn't just remember that they were free. They were free in this moment. They were experiencing something. They were connecting with something that was true of them one time and one day will be true of them again. They're experiencing it in the moment of this meal right here. Uh, God brought them together around these sacred kinds of meals. Now, the the Jewish people uh, made the same mistake that Adam and Eve made. Uh, They chose to reject God's way and to reject God's wisdom, and they chose to take life for themselves, to be true to their own hearts, and to do life the way they wanted to do life. But here's the good news. Though they rejected God and his wisdom and they chose not to obey God, God still didn't give up. And God said, though the Israelites have failed uh, to to be who God called them to be, God said, one day I'm going to do something again. One day God says, I'm going to restore my people uh, and there's going to be a new covenant and I'm going to pour out my life and blessing in spite of Israel's failures. God says, I'm going to pour out my life and blessing on on these people, and I'm going to give them new hearts, and there's going to be a new covenant that brings life and blessing to all the world. Now, and the prophet said, on this day when that happens, when God pours out this new covenant uh, and, and does this new thing, guess what's going to happen on that day? You'll never guess it. A meal. It's going to be a meal. Listen, listen to what Isaiah says. Uh, he says, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty, and he's speaking about that day 
when, when God does this new thing that God is going to do and he restores his people and pours out life and blessing in this new covenant, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. On that day, on that day, God's gonna do a new thing and God's gonna lay out before his people a banquet and they will feast and they will know that they are God's people and they will become the conduits through which God's love and grace pours out. The prophet said one day that day was gonna come. In, in spite of Israel's failures, in spite of their rejection of God's ways, the prophets held out this hope that someday, somehow, through somebody, uh, God's plan was gonna get back on track. And then one day, Jesus appears. And, and think about what happens when Jesus comes. Jesus feeds people. He heals people. He even, he even overcomes death and brings dead people back to life. And wherever Jesus goes, it's like some of that life that was once known in the Garden of Eden infiltrates into the here and the now. Uh, I think about it like those, those Disney movies where, where the character walks through this dark area and like flowers and everything blooms behind them. Y'all kind of got a picture of that. Everywhere that Jesus is walking, man, life, that, that life that God intended, people are fed and, and people are loved and, and the love of God is pouring out and, and life is happening and a blessing is happening. Wherever Jesus goes, the life of the garden is being poured back in. It's infiltrating the here and the now. And multiple times, uh, Jesus feeds people. And one of those times when he feeds them, John chapter six tells us that Jesus had um, fed a whole bunch of people and then they just wanted some more food. And uh, then a, kind of an argument happens after that. And Jesus says these words in John chapter six, beginning verse 53. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Just, just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This sounds really strange. Yeah, you read this out of context. You read this out of the context of the whole biblical story and it's just weird. But think about it in the context of the biblical story we've been telling. Can you think of another time where people were, were told to go and eat from something and they would live forever? A place where they would go and they would find food uh, that would give them eternal life? It's the tree of life. It's the tree of life. It's what's happening right here. It's Jesus is, is inviting them, uh, a people who were once banished from the Garden of Eden, from the very source of life and, and blessing and everything that's good. Jesus is saying, come and eat from me. Just as they were to go and eat from the tree of life, Jesus is saying, come and eat from me. He's saying, go around, but don't stop at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil any longer. Man, don't try to take life for yourselves. Don't trust in yourselves. Don't, don't, don't simply try to be in charge. He's inviting us, come and trust in me. I am the very source of life and wisdom and blessing. And Jesus is saying, come and feast on me. The way into the garden, the presence of God, the life of Christ is being offered to his people again. And Jesus Jesus says, come, feast on me. Come and feast on me. He's inviting us into a story that ought to be very familiar to us as we've read. Jesus is laying out a choice before us. We can, we can trust in ourselves. We can trust in our own ideas of good. We can make up for ourselves what life is all about. Or Jesus says, you can come to me and I will give you life. He says, you can come to me and trust me and I will give you wisdom. Uh, Seek me above everything else, he says. And all the other things, he says, I'll deal with. Come to me, he invites us. So on that last night, 
when Jesus was about to be crucified early the next morning, Jesus gathers his disciples together uh, for one last meal. And it is the Passover meal that they are eating together. And Luke 22, beginning in verse 14, tells us this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus gathered his disciples together and said, this is the new covenant. This is the new covenant that the prophets told us about. And he invites them to feast on him, um, to, to, to gather. And, and when we gather to remember that the bread is his body and, and, and the wine or the, the Welch's grape juice that we use uh, is his blood that's being poured out for us. Uh, and he invites us to feast on him. Uh, and to know that in him alone is life. And as we do this, as we come forward and people get up out of their seats and you come forward, you are coming forward again. Uh, you're making that, you're, you're being given that same choice that Adam and Eve had and the Jewish people had. And Jesus is saying, come to me, come to me. Uh, trust me and find your life in me. And when we come to this table, we're not simply remembering what Jesus did a long time ago. We're experiencing his presence giving us life even today. Jesus is inviting. We're not coming taking anything. Jesus is, 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 is alive now and he's offering us right now. He's saying, come, come. Uh, we believe that, that Christ is somehow mysteriously, beautifully, spiritually present in the midst of this meal. And he is inviting us, come and trust me. And when you come up here in front of all these people, you're making the decision to bypass the tree of the knowledge of good and, e and evil and to come to Christ and say, Christ, in you alone is life. We trust you. Uh, give us your wisdom. Uh, thank you for making a way for us to live in the presence of God and know eternal life. And we're not just remembering that life for, the, for a moment, we're experiencing that life. Uh, we're, we're experiencing his goodness being poured out upon us again. And yet, even as we experience this and, and we come and, and, and we, we, we come before him and say, Lord, we, we trust you. We trust your word. We trust your wisdom. Um, we trust what you did for us for eternal life. Even as we come for this, we are amazingly aware of the pain and brokenness and dysfunction of the world in which we live today. And, and so while we're eating this, we're also looking forward to a day uh, when, when God makes all things right. And, and guess what's going to happen on that day when God makes all things right? Guess what's going to happen? You'll never guess. It's going to blow you away. I mean, kind of, you know, it kind of begins with the people in the garden, the very beginning, kind of begins with the people being invited to come and eat. Guess how it's going to end? You'll never get it. Yeah, yeah. Revelation chapter 19 uh, says, uh, it's talking about the fall of Babylon. And Babylon represents all the brokenness and dysfunction that human and evil spiritual forces have brought into the world. And Revelation 19 is what's going to happen when all that's destroyed. And so Revelation 19 is a celebration that Babylon, all the ways that humans and evil spiritual forces have messed up God's creation, all that's going to be destroyed and God's going to make all things right. And then chapter nine is a celebration. And this is what it says. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, 
For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That moment when history is consummated, uh, where it's all heading to is going to happen. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding banquet of the Lamb when he makes all things right. When we celebrate this meal. We remember what Christ has done for us. We experience, we come to him again and we experience the fact that that we don't take life. It's given to us and Christ gives life to us. And we look forward to that day when there's going to be another meal, but we're not simply knowing that that meal is going to happen one day. We're not simply looking forward to it. We're experiencing it right now. In just a moment, we're going to get a taste of Revelation 19. People are going to come to this table, young and old, Black and white, poor and rich, Republicans and Democrats. Um, we're going to stream to this table. And we're all going to praise him. And we're all going to acknowledge as we come before him that life is found in him alone. And as you watch people come to this table and feast in this moment, you're not simply acknowledging something that's going to happen God's giving you a taste of it right now. That's what this is. It's a taste of what's going to be offered to us. Um, This is why we gather right here. Um, And we celebrate this meal. And as we celebrate this meal, we remember the whole biblical story that that started with uh, um, a meal and and God nourished his people with meals. And then Jesus comes offering himself as a meal. And then one day it's going to consummate with a meal. Man, as we come to this table right here, we say, God, we're participating in this story and we trust you and we look forward and we taste now that life that is to come. Let's pray. Gracious Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this meal this opportunity to come again, that you have opened up again, uh, Eden to us, even in some small way. Uh, Lord, we get to come to the tree of life. Uh, We get to experience your goodness and your grace. Uh, We get to be called yours. We get to taste eternal life and to know that nothing will ever separate us from your love. And so, Lord, we we praise you for that. May may we uh, treasure this meal that we get to celebrate together. May it be beautiful and holy and sacred for us. And may we come as those um, who make the choice um, by your grace and through the outpouring of your Holy Spirit um, who say, Lord, we, we, we come before you knowing apart from you, um, where else would we find life? We trust you. So Lord, we remember on that night when Jesus was betrayed, how he took bread and he gave thanks And he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we remember how when the supper was over, he raised up the cup and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. So Lord, we gather in remembrance of you. Uh, We gather though, not simply remembering you, but but tasting that life that you would give to us. Uh, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, make these simple gifts of bread and juice. Be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ that redeemed by you, we might be conduits by which your love and blessing and grace would flow to all the world. Make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at the wedding banquet of the Lamb. Uh, We pray this in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.